In this episode, you're going to learn how you can create meaningful impact inside an organization that doesn't have a strong design heritage, and most of all, do it without wearing yourself down. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I'm Burjar Soy. This is the Soy Design Show, episode 148. Hi, my name is Mark Fontaine and welcome back to the Surf Design Show. On this show, we explore what's beneath the surface of Surf Design. What are those hidden things that make a difference between success and failure, all to help you design great services that have a positive impact on people, business and our planet. Our guest in this episode is Burchu Arsoy. Butch started out in the graphic design field and slowly but surely found her home in service design. Over the years, Butch has had many different roles, both on the agency side as well as in-house. Today, Butch is a design lead at a well-known global brand and manufacturer of home appliances. I feel that the conversation in this episode is a really important one because we're going to talk about how to make sure that you don't wear yourself out as a service design professional, something that I unfortunately have seen way too often. I feel that this is especially relevant if you're inside an organization that is going through a large scale transformation where the supporting structures to do great service design work aren't yet in place or at best are sub optimal. So in this episode, you're going to hear perspectives on questions like what can you do to set the right expectations for yourself and the people around you? How do you measure progress when you don't have full control over the outcome? Where and when you should draw the line and decide to move on to a different challenge? And finally, what all this has to do with frozen lasagna. And I promise you, once you know, you won't be able to forget. If you enjoy conversations like this and want to continue growing as a service design professional, make sure to subscribe to the channel and click that bell icon because we bring a new video like this every week or so. So that about wraps it up for the introduction. Now it's time to sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation with Borju Arsoy. Welcome to the show, Borju. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, Good to have you on the show. Uh, we're going to talk about the topic, which is uh, super important. Uh, it has to do with health and well-being of people. So that's always uh, something worth discussing. Hasn't been on the show that often. So I hope this sort of also inspires more people to come forward and maybe talk more about this topic. Um, but as always, before we do that, I'd love to know a little bit more about who you are and what you do these days. Who, could you please give a brief introduction? Sure. My name is Burju, and I am a multidisciplinary designer. For the last four years, I have been working in the big organizations, and currently I'm working at Electrolux as the digital product design lead. And previously, I worked at design consultancies agencies, but also in big corporations um, in-house. Um, and I do have a background in graphic design as master's, and I actually studied engineering as bachelor's which makes it very interesting, especially when I get to talk to engineers uh, in my day-to-day -day work. Super interesting. I uh, I also have a engineering background, so that also makes interesting conversations mm -hmm. with uh, non-designers. Uh, would you, uh, the 60 second question rapid fire round, I have five questions uh, for you. Um, your goal is to answer them as quickly as possible just the first thing that comes to your mind are you ready okay i'll give it a try <laughs> all right let's do this would you what's always in your fridge mm, you can always find yogurt and cheese in my fridge yogurt and cheese all right um if you could recommend one book to somebody which book would you recommend um maybe the book that I'm currently reading, I have just started, but it's called uh, The High House. It's about um, not so far future, but it's about the climate change and the day, the most feared day comes, everybody and every place is now flooded and there's a huge crisis in the world. Um, it's in the beginning, it feels a bit dystopian, but maybe it's going to change towards the end. It's, it's a fiction book, but I think it's really nice to read about these kind of things. Hmm. We'll add a link uh, in the show notes to that. 
Would you? Uh, I'm really curious, what was your first job? My first job was actually during my master's degree. I worked in the university as a web designer um, slash graphic designer in a small institution that was about entrepreneurship. Hmm. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, my next question is, if you could work from anywhere in the world, which place would you pick? Somewhere that's always warm and sunny, uh, that also has a long daylight, I would say. Mm. Any specific place? Are you looking in Asia, Americas, Europe? It doesn't really matter as long as the sun <laughs> okay. is shining. All right. Uh... Cool. Now, the final question uh, we have uh, traditionally here on the show is, do you remember your first encounter with service design? Yes, I do. Um, it was many years ago, 2012, I guess. I was working as a freelancer and I was doing the UX UI design of several different mobile apps. Um, and the way that I was introduced into service design was through um, an agency, which then became my employer. Um, and it was really fascinating to see the world of the service design and explore it and learn from the very best. Um, and I still feel like I actually owe a lot to those people because it felt like a great introduction to service design. Mm. Cool. Uh, interesting journey that you've been on, like exploring different career paths, different disciplines, and then eventually uh, sort of stumbling upon service design. I guess many people have a similar experience. Uh, thank you for this uh, 60 second question rapid fire round, which was probably a bit longer than 60 seconds, but now we know a little bit more about you and what you do. Um, would you let's transition into today's topic and sometimes i like to start an episode by talking about the end and let's try to do this uh, today as well um what do you hope that somebody will get out of our conversation if they stick around till the end of the episode that's a very good question um i think it could be different depending on the person listening the episode um Maybe some people are going to relate to the things that we are going to talk about. And some people might feel a bit uh, more optimistic about the future of service design. Um, or some people might feel a bit more pessimistic. I think it really depends. You'll see. Mm. Okay, let's see. Let's dive into this. So um, when we were preparing our conversation, one of the topics that came up is the challenges and struggles that service designers face when entering traditional organizations that don't have a design heritage that are maybe going through a large scale transformation, a digital transformation. And how do you not just survive as a service designer in those circumstances, but how do you actually thrive and do that in a way where you don't burn yourself out? Um, did I summarize that sort of correctly? Yes, you did. <laughs> okay, now uh, let's go back to the beginning. And um, I'm curious, when I invited you for the show and you came up with this topic, why did you feel that this is something that would be important to address with the community? I think first and foremost, um, that's a topic that I can relate to. And I can only speak from my own personal experience because I am not an expert in healthcare or well-being. But for the last couple of years, I have read a lot about it and I have reflected a lot on my several different positions in different places. And when I talk to other designers in general, I think that we do share um, a lot in common when it comes to our job and the places that we work. Um, so I, I think it is really interesting for also young designers to know that what they're getting into, because when they get educated, in schools or institutions, they might feel like this environment is all glamorous and it's always fun and workshops and whatnot. But the reality is that it is also very challenging and probably it requires many more skills than um, than the ones that are taught in school. Mm. Yeah, there is, uh, there tends to be a quite romantic view of service design and our work from the outside looks a lot of fun. People are engaged, people are doing creative stuff, like who wouldn't want to be doing that? But what you don't see is all the hard work and 
uh, struggles, uh, objections, rejections that you sort of have to overcome to actually get to doing uh, the fun stuff. And that's uh, like you mentioned, it's not something which you read about in service design books. That's correct. And mm -hmm. it's never also mentioned during um, the process of service design. When we talk about service design process, the double diamond, we always go through it in a linear manner as if everything you know, falls into place in order without any obstacles or resistance or anything like that. It might be true to one project, but when we talk about the big organization and a service designer role as in-house, that is rarely the case. Um, one might start from the beginning and then they might have to pause in the middle of the of the process when they finish the first diamond or they might need to go back start all over again um, it is really not that easy to start and, and finish um, when we talk about the big initiatives and especially the transformation context of the large organizations mm -hmm. i i would dare to go as far as to say that the double diamond is misleading and it's setting the wrong expectations it's actually setting people up for for failure and disappointment. I know that this might be controversial, but uh, like you said, it in reality, like it doesn't play out that way. I think it would be much better if we had a honest representation of how the design process looks and what you can expect when you actually engage in doing design rather than expecting to go through it in a neatly um, fashion so you mentioned some of these challenges that people run into um i'm curious like let's dive into that a little bit more like what are some of those expectations that you see people are having of going in-house and doing service design that might not necessarily be true what are some maybe i don't know misconceptions or things that we would be good if we would set them straight in, in schools and textbooks mm -hmm. Many people, when they're asked why they want to make the transition to in-house from agencies, I think they would give the same answer um, because they want to create more impact, right? They don't want to finish off one project and do the handover, but they want to breathe the organization. They want to do multiple projects. They want to see the long-term influence and impact of the things they do. The keyword is really long-term in this case because they would never ever get the gratification they would do from a small project they, they do in an agency or a consultancy setup. And when they find themselves in a situation um, which gets a bit longer and longer and longer term and, and more challenging in terms of the different networks of the organization and the different initiatives that are actually depending on one another, um, that is actually not true. Of course, the impact is always there. But maybe we cannot really say that I want to create more impact. I want to be able to see it. It's a different kind of environment. And I think it depends on what kind of life stage one is going through in their private lives. And what are their priorities and how do they want to contribute to the organization? That's the most important thing. Mm. Uh, sounds interesting. Could you explain a bit more what you mean with the life stage and how that relates to where somebody might, the kind of challenges they might be taking on? I think um, it's safe to say that agencies and consultancies are really, really high paced organizations, right? And people usually take on one project and they run with it until the deadline and then they finish it off, they jump onto the next project. It might be a bit more exciting and, and different and higher paced than in-house organizations. Because also when we talk about the, the companies hiring these consultancies, of course, they on, also want to finish the project off real quick. So it doesn't really represent the real picture of how they actually work. Um, but in the in-house context, um, the, the pace can be lower. It can be a bit slower. Um, and in that case, I think embracing this long-term mentality and maybe lowering our own expectations in a way is really the key. And maybe for some people who are in the beginning of their career, they might have really high expectations of themselves. They want, maybe they want to just uh, improve their skills and advance in their careers faster. In that case, um, if they come across with a, a slower paced in-house position, it might not be the right opportunity for them. 
or it might be totally different. Maybe they want to um, spend more time with the family. They want to sp uh, spend more time with their personal hobbies or projects, or maybe they have another idea they want to work on. Um, it really depends on the context and type of the organization. And I think also depends a bit on the industry as well. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I, I don't think we talk a lot about that. Like uh, what, what do you want from your job? Like, do you want excitement or do you want to, do you have the patience? Uh, what is it that you want to get out of this? Uh, one thing I found interesting is you've been on both, both sides, like the agency side and now in-house. <clears throat> I'm curious how your um, expectations have evolved. Like, what have you learned about being uh, on the, within an organization that you maybe didn't that you maybe would have liked to know before you started? Hmm. Um, you're right, because I do have experience in both sides. And I can definitely say that one feels more creative than the other, but it also depends on the type, pro type of project that they focus on. Um, working in-house in large corporations, they also bring a lot because um, first and foremost, you learn more about the business. You learn more about the organization and organizational challenges. So the type of problems that you start to solve um, actually um, begins to evolve from just a very well-defined brief to something that's a bit more fuzzy. And in most cases, the problem is not clearly stated. There might be a solution in place. Um, you might have to start from the solution that some other people came up with and then guide them or convince them to take a few steps back. And maybe if needed, um, the, you might also guide them to pivot that project. I think it really depends um, the type of um, type of projects that one wants to work on and also in which areas that they would like to develop themselves in. Mm -hmm. From the consultancy side, I see that ideation and brainstorming and concepting is really strong. But when it comes to in-house positions, I think execution gains more importance in a way because everybody can come up with great ideas and the roadmaps and whatnot. Um, but so far, one thing that I've learned is that um, coming up with the ideas is the easy bit, but trying to execute those ideas and be successful is a totally different story. Mm. Yeah, and we that is a topic that we do often address, like... Uh, everything that happens after you've done the initial research and the co-creation and uh, sort of how do you get, how do you do the backstage part of the service? How do you actually get it uh, into the world? That's that's a whole different uh, game. Now, um, I'm curious also, again, to, to your personal experience, if you look at uh, what you do today, how has that, um, how has that evolved in terms of like some activities that you might not have expected to be doing as a designer uh, five years ago that you're sort of had to pick up, pick up and do to, to be successful? Like, I'm curious, like, what are some of these activities that were, that are new to you, but you think could be valuable to a lot of designers? Maybe we can also mention about the transition from uh, being an individual contributor as a designer into st uh, stepping into the leadership uh, models because for the last three years I stepped into leadership roles and more than the designer roles and again this depends on the type of the organization and the culture um, so I would say that I was not going to um, maybe I wasn't imagining that I was going to be in meetings as much as I do now um, which which is bittersweet in a way, because this is the way to go. This is how we transform the organizations. This is how we can contribute and lead. But also on the other hand, one part of me misses um, the times that I was doing hands-on design and actively contributing to the deliveries. I think one part of me still um, wants to do the craft work of design and collaborate with other people, other designers and work with them. Um, but it is a really, really hard balance, I think. Uh, another thing is that right now I'm managing a small team of designers. And obviously this responsibility comes with uh, a, a lot of response. Like, first of all, I'm the person responsible for their per, uh, professional development and careers, right? This is a very, very important topic. Even though the organizations support with their 
frameworks, some different routines and tools. It is still, um, I would say it's not for everyone. Maybe not everyone would uh, enjoy doing this kind of work. And last but not least, um, I would say that being a manager um, also comes with a lot of admin work, um, which is not related with design at all, but it is something that needs to be done. And if there isn't any other person that you can delegate that work and be done for us, then we have to deal with it too. And when we talk about the admin work, of course, um, we have to touch upon the very old systems and processes that we have to use internally, which is super frustrating for a service designer because every single day we know that how that service could, could be improved and why it hasn't improved so far. It is super, super challenging to keep calm and still, you know, do our work than going into a complaining mood all the time. Hmm. Yeah, so let's uh, thank you for sharing this. And I, again, I'd love to dive a little bit deeper into this because um, like there's a reason why these are sort of big organizations, traditional non-design heritage. Um, and then you come in as a, somebody with a design perspective on things and it's going to take a very long time to even take a very small step with the organization. If you look at your own personal situation, how do you keep the spirit up? How do, where do you find the motivation and uh, sort of maybe signs that you're moving in the right direction to, yeah, to continue working at it? How, yeah, yeah, that's, that's the question. <laughs> um, I think. The signs can be very, very small, and we might need to put extra efforts to see those signs sometimes. And one day can be really frustrating, whereas the next day could be a bit more promising and hopeful. One thing I remember from my personal story, um, I was working on a project once, and I was doing some customer research. And we had the big presentation with one of the senior leaders, which I was presenting the insights that we have found. And there was a reaction from that senior manager in the beginning, um, even to the extent that um, um, we were kind of accused that we, we had misunderstood what the customer said, because they knew for sure it wasn't like that. So they were relying on their assumptions and biases and thoughts, and then um, reacting our insights in a way that um, they were not true. I mean, they're not facts. We cannot, of course, talk about true or false in this case, but they're the insights and that's what the customer said, right? Um, so that's a really not a good sign, I would say. Um, but then uh, within the same person, I have seen how that situation evolved within time. Uh, from that point of resistance, six months later, the very same person was inviting me to other big presentations to talk about the project to present the same insights that he was reacting in the beginning uh, in front of a large audience. So I think that's a really good sign that um, something was shifting and that was visible in that instance. So, and I ended up remembering that scene, not like a bad thing, but now it has become almost like a nice story for my, for, like, for my career in a way that um, I have learned quite a lot from it. Um, it's all about these small signs improvements yeah. that we can see then the big jumps uh, or the big leaps that the businesses can make yeah so uh, th th this story sort of has a happy ending which is great and it took six months maybe to to get there but um like what what piece of advice would you give to other in-house service designers who are maybe just starting out their journey like and they get into this meeting they recognize the story they get so super frustrated like Nobody, nobody you hear understands me. Like, what am I doing here? This is never going to change. And then sort of what advice would you give to them so that they do manage to stick around for the next six or 12 months and then hopefully see that like the seeds have been planted and the flowers start to grow? I think they can try to talk to other people who were in that meeting because we all have different perspectives and especially um, if they manage to talk to a non-designer and ask feedback um, for them to express how the meeting went from their point of view, I think it's really important for us to, to put things in a different perspective by listening others and their own reflections. Um, it also depends on the personality type. 
you know, whether we like to look from a pessimistic side or more from an optimistic side. And if they believe that they have a more pessimistic um, personality, I would advise to talk to always more optimistic people and ask their point of view. Um, get a stranger's opinion. Um, try to see what went well, even in that worst scenario or the situation that really disturbs you. There are always some positives that we choose not to see when we're in that negative mood. Mm. And um, I'm really curious when when you share the story, like um, the idea of presenting to somebody, uh, someone is is um, all, almost creates a us versus them situation. While in our design philosophy mindset approach, we uh, advocate for co-creation. I'm curious if you've experienced something similar, like let's say that uh, that even though you're presenting, that it would be done from a co-creation perspective, like then you're trying to together get to the next step. Uh, does this make sense? Uh, have you seen this happen? Does this change anything? It does. It really does. Um, because after that meeting, it was actually some kind of co-creation session that we diverged into. And of course, it changed the, the dynamic of the room, the setup, but it also depends on the culture of the organization. Some organizations are not that comfortable in contributing, especially if they have a very strict hierarchy of the different roles. It, it can even become a challenge to invite someone to stand up and walk over to the wall, grab a post-it, write something, put it up. Because many times, even when I was working as a consultant, um, there were people in the room who were just saying things and then they were really, really reluctant on writing something on the post-it by themselves and we were writing for them. So it really depends on, first of all, who we are working with as individuals and then the culture of the organization and how they are structured. So, um... That makes sense. And if we um, try to uh, figure out again these things, like I, I'm, I'm trying to find pointers and tips. Like how do you, how do you make sure that you stick around, that you don't give up? And I think it, it again has to do with these signs of success. Like what, what were, oh yeah, what were some of these signs of success? You, you mentioned that you see small signs, but yeah, uh, when you're uh, within an agency, you sort of finish a pro uh, project and then you could say, uh, we finished the project, that's a success. But when you're in-house and things are moving slowly, how do you know that you're moving in the right direction? There might be cases that you wouldn't know if you're moving in the right direction, but you're moving. That's something, right? And things might not always move in the right direction. And that's okay too. Sometimes they diverge a little bit or they can go um off track and these are the things that usually happens and it is really challenging in a way to think that they would actually get back on their course and everything will go according to the plan um, i would say that of course it's important to stick and get things done and contribute to the organization but also it's okay to leave if they feel like it's not the right place for them to work yeah, this is an amazing piece of advice. Like uh, when you mentioned that, I was like, "Yeah, obviously." Like, yeah, just keep, just keep moving, and don't be too concerned with if it's the right direction. Like, uh, if if you put smart people in in a room and you follow the right process, it's the it's the trust the process kind of uh, approach. Just do the right things, and eventually you'll end up where you need to be uh, without having to worry if this is if every step is actually very linear in a linear fashion contributing to the next milestone like it's it's take a more organic approach that that that's what i'm hearing you say at least exactly and i can also give some other examples from the agency world because 90 percent of the project that i worked on we ended up somewhere different than we started it. And it, it, it did look very different what the brief was asking. This is very natural for the design process. Things evolve, priorities change, and we learn along the way about the organization, their backend systems and the customer insights and everything around it. And then we realize that the brief is actually not really asking for us to solve the right problem, but it was pointing at something different. And in this case, it's okay to actually end up somewhere different that we have not imagined. 
That could also be the case in the large organizations uh, while we're working as in-house designers. Maybe the, the way that things started might not be really uh, right. And it is very natural to actually go in a different direction from that point. Maybe it's going to go back and find its path. And then this time it's going to start in the right place. Then trying to you know, start in the wrong place, end up with the correct solution is really difficult. Maybe it needs to be a, a lesson for everybody. Um, because we also learn from our failures. Maybe we need to let people fail instead of trying to pull them into the right direction. Um, and it's going to be valuable for everybody too. And of course, there's going to be loss of time. There's going to be loss of money. Maybe they're going to need to lose some people <laughs> along the way, but it's going to be valuable in the long term. Mm. I'm, as you are also... Uh coaching, mentoring, leading uh, some other designers. I'm, I'm curious, how important is reflection for you? Uh, standing still and seeing sort of what has happened, what can we learn from this? And how, again, how can we define progress? And also from your personal experience, how important is reflection in this whole thing? I would say it's very important and maybe Another important thing is also to encourage other people to reflect, encourage other designers to reflect on how things went in a particular meeting or at the end of a project or even within a week. Um, I started this uh, ritual within our group uh, that we are posting a reflection question every week uh, on Friday in our communication channel. And it is totally um, up to the individuals if they want to share their reflection in that channel, they are free to write it. Uh, if they want to keep it to themselves, they're free to keep it to themselves. But it's more like it's more about the process and thinking, not really about the sharing in that in that case. Yeah, I can imagine that that you sort of reflection helps you to ground and appreciate any progress that you've made, even if, like you said, it's uh, you've lost time, you've lost money, but you still manage to change something else or change some minds or get somebody involved in a project and like standing still and being grateful for any kind of pro uh, progress that uh, seems to be i can imagine that that's really helpful if you're on a uh, on a journey that's going to take months or maybe years inside an organization yeah indeed or maybe you have built a connection with another person even though the project is not going according to the direction that you envision uh, or maybe you learned something really important that's going to benefit you next month next year or the next five years these are really the things that we cannot really think when we are always here and now. But I think that we need to also come up with tools for our own sake that we can think about um, these kind of situations in, in a long term and what could be the gains, what could be the pains. Not everything is resolved here and now. There are so many effects that they're going to continue. Maybe there is another individual who is going to take what you have taught them and apply it in their own day-to-day -day work or in their own project. We might not be aware of these things um, and it might go unnoticed, which is fine. But this is also a very, very important step. Do you think um, people who are early in their career are able to sort of uh, put this in perspective? Like you've been doing this for quite a while. You've been through this journey a few times. You know that things will eventually turn out all right. Uh, if somebody is just starting out, we can tell them that things will turn out all right, but like that's does it have? Do you feel it? It um, is it does it have to be a lived experience, or are there ways that we can sort of help young designers to to build this confidence as well? I think we can also try to be a bit more empathetic with them when they feel this frustration, because I can relate to that feeling from early on in my career. When I was told that everything was going to you know, be fine in the end, I was getting more furious. It's like, you don't understand me. You don't listen to what I'm saying and those kind of things. So I think it's really important because we have been through this path. Like you said, we had a lot of experience and learnings and failures along the way, which they lack in the beginning of their career. Um, so I would say that it is important, but also it's their own journey and they have to go through this on their own, um, no matter what we say and no matter how we try to um, get our experience across, um, they have to leave themselves. 
I yeah, I totally agree. You can sort of prepare them. It's it's like with doing math in school. Like at the moment you're doing it, you're like, what what's the case? And uh, at some point in life, uh, maybe you run into a situation where you think, oh okay, now I now I understand why I was learning all these other things. And like sharing these stories here on the show is hopefully also um, a way to prepare people uh, for things that might come, which might not be relevant today, but when they come, they at least be uh, more, uh, they'll be able to put it more into perspective. Now, uh, Burju, I'm going to ask you a question which will come as a surprise to uh, somebody who's listening right now. Um, but I know you have a very interesting story about lasagna and i you have to you have to share it with us what's the story with lasagna yes we talked about this previously right um it was an analogy uh, i think that's a perfect analogy to represent some organizations and why things don't progress um so basically some organizations are organized in a way that is almost like a frozen lasagna and when you try to reheat the frozen lasagna um, it's really important to reheat it gradually and slowly, otherwise you're going to risk to burn the top and the bottom layers, whereas the middle part is still going to stay frozen. So it's really not hard to guess. The, the lower part represents the, the lower hierarchy in the organization, and the top part is the upper management, and the middle frozen part of the lasagna is the middle management. And sometimes the lasagna can be really thick. The middle management layers can be really, really high, and sometimes it can be thin. Um, this is an important analogy because the way that it was expressed in one of my previous jobs was that um, this was some kind of acceptance. Um, but the rebel in me was objecting to that because, I mean, why do we have to eat lasagna then? Can it be another pasta dish? Can it be a bit you know less layers than this many layers if we know that this is a problem and we cannot um, reheat the middle layers do we have to stick to that so that was the kind of reflection that i i had mm, yeah and this is uh i i love that metaphor and i uh, don't recall hearing it uh before and, and i think it's um it very well reflects on like the people the, the people on the ground often very well understand the purpose of service design. The people who are working uh, with customers, the day-to-day -day interactions, often the top level management, the, the board level, they get it like customer experience or customer centricity. They, they know why it's important for the long-term success of the business. But like you said, the middle layer, it's, um, it's not that they don't get it, but it's often that the structures aren't in place to support this way of working or better said, the supporting structures support a different kind of way of working and keep that uh, in place. So it's, yeah, this is, this is a very, uh, at least for me, a very good analogy. And I would even add something else to that, because you said that, yes, the upper management buys in the value of service design and there is no uh, obstacles working with the people who are working as individual contributors in an organization. But also, I think um, we need to challenge upper management when we feel like they have the buy in in the value of design. We need to ask them the question, OK, what are you willing to give up in order to bring this competence in house? What are the things that you are going to give up? in order to make service design be nourished and nurtured in the organization so that it can survive. This is really important because there might be some elements from the culture of the organization that they might need to give up. There might be some old processes that they need to change, or they might need to do some reorganization. Because that was the, the thing that I think I heard from someone. If they try to bring another um, engineering discipline, since we mentioned about engineering in the beginning, I'm giving an example from that. Let's say that it's an organization that decides to bring mechanical engineers, uh, right? And in that case, I'm sure that they would go some sort of restructuring the organization. But when it comes to embedding design, no one actually thinks that this is necessary. They think that just sprinkling some designers here and there without thinking it through is okay and it's going to work out. No, that's not the case. I mean, if we have to think about changing an organization when we bring some people from other disciplines, it's the same for design. We have to maybe change the organization. We have to think 
how this is going to evolve in the next year, how this is going to evolve in the next five or 10 years. I think for many people, it is still um, really hard to accept that design is a discipline like any other discipline in businesses. That could be one of the main challenges still. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. And uh, I'm also curious how well advanced we are as a community, as a field to articulate what we actually want to ask from top level management then. Right. Uh, we talked about service design textbooks and schools. Um, this isn't uh, also a topic that I see being discussed a lot there. Like, so you, when you do get that conversation with the CEO, what is it that you ask for? Like, what are the supporting structures that would allow you to be more impactful and more valuable to the organization? It is really important. And this is the case that we talk about when you get the job and you start working in an organization and even before joining an organization we can ask these difficult questions to the hiring managers right so what yeah you uh, it's funny that you say that these are difficult questions uh maybe <laughs> they are important questions so what would be some of these things you would ask the next time you have a job interview i think first and foremost i would ask them to clearly define how they imagine this role to change in the next six months, one year, five years. And I would ask them to describe with their own words what would be the contribution to the organization within these different milestones um, in the timeline. Because it's really easy to start with something with the role description and that short term vision. Um, but I think that people at least um, have some kind of thinking even though it's not fully fleshed out, there might be some kind of thinking about these kind of roles in the organization. Do they think about having a design organization in place at some point? Are they thinking about hiring a chief design officer at some point? Or do they only want to stay at an operational level, um, not at a strategic level when it comes to design? These are really important questions. And this might feel a bit uncomfortable to ask in the job interviews, and especially for younger designers. And I totally get that. But this is one of the most important factors for them to understand whether they would be happy in with their job or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this uh, this helps you to understand if you're going to be doing um, the operations part, running workshops or doing user interviews, and that can be totally fine. But if you're coming in as a service designer and hoping to have influence on important business decisions and helping to set out the strategy, which I think a lot of service designers have uh, that expectation or that hope and that desire, and you sort of hear that that's not the <laughs> that's not the role the organization in, uh, organization is imagining for you, like you'd better know that upfront then and confront uh, that upfront then getting into this job and six months down the line being frustrated that you don't get invited to the right conversations. Exactly. Another important question could be about the reporting lines, especially in organizations which they which don't have the central design organization. It's really important for the designer to ask um, who is going to be my manager, who am I going to report to? Uh, it could be the business side, which is fine. But in that case, they should actually manage their own expectations um, in a way that they're not going to grow as fast in their careers in terms of gaining more design skills or design experience, but they would learn more from the business side. Or it could be the other way around. It could be uh, the reporting line could be design, um, but they might still lack the skills, uh, the business skills, uh, which can be super crucial in that particular organization. Um, I'm also reading a book currently that talks about these different reporting lines, operational reporting lines versus functional reporting lines. There are pros and cons for both approaches, but I think this is really important for people to understand. Um, it is really crucial. Maybe it's more important than the description of the job itself. It's so interesting. And I'd love to one day, I don't know, maybe do a course or webinar or training or whatever. Like, what are the, the questions a designer should be asking during uh, a job interview because I think it will surprise a lot of people and um, it, it works both ways. I think for hiring managers, understanding like what's important for designers in order to fully operate and, and contribute the most value that they can inside the organization, we need to have different conversations uh, there. 
Was there anything else? Another question that you had in mind? No. <laughs> okay. So um, there's one more thing uh, I'd like to go back to, and um, maybe this will uh, nicely wrap up the conversation that we're having. Um, I would formulate this question like, where do you draw the line? So let's imagine that you are in-house, that you did get in with hopefully the right expectations, and then still things maybe don't go uh, according to plan. Have you seen examples where you thought, well, okay, this, enough is enough? I think apart from our personal experiences in this case, um, we can try to look into what other people are experiencing to really understand if there is any kind of hope for that organization to change in the short term or not. And I can actually give a couple of more examples about that. Um, even though in the project that I was not actively contributing, but coaching other people, non-designers working on those projects, I was hearing the same kind of signs that are not so positive about the organization and how they are not changing or embracing change in, in a way. Because there was a group of people who worked in this kind of innovation hub and came up with an idea. Um, they went through the process really well. They, their uh, solution was really good. The problem they were solving was really good. It was the right problem. They prototyped the solution. They had a very solid business case behind it. They verified the concept. And then when it comes to going out in different markets and testing with real customers, they got a huge resistance, huge resistance. And it is getting resistance is normal, but I think um, the, the problem was that they couldn't get the support that they needed from the upper management in this case to make it work. So in a way that they were left alone, and this is a really important sign um because no matter how hard we try and no matter how good we work in terms of the projects the solutions we come up with and even though on paper we feel that they have the buy-in um they need to show it with actions not only with words so i think this is really important when you feel stuck in a difficult situation who is helping you and who is showing that support with their actions not only with their words this could be another important thing to observe what other feel what other people are experiencing and who are supporting them who are advocating what they're doing in the organization if we cannot find anyone if there is no name that comes to our mind then okay maybe you have learned what you had to learn in this organization maybe it's time to move on or um you might give it another try mm. yeah if you uh it's it's really hard to stick it out uh, totally on your own. Like if you don't have a lot of allies or no allies that can uh, support you on this journey, then uh, yeah, then, then the burden becomes really hard. And maybe the conclusion is that it's not the right time or the right place right now. And maybe in a year, two or three, uh, the seeds that you've planted will sort of have grown and uh, into yeah, into a different, into an an uh, culture which is more open and more ready to to this approach. Exactly. Maybe the whole organization is not going to change that easily and quickly, but smaller parts, smaller teams, maybe they have already changed. Who knows? Mm. Um, but you, I'm curious if you had to look back on your career and uh, let's not go back to the beginning, but maybe five years ago, uh, if you have to pick one thing, what is the thing you wish somebody had told you about where you are today, some piece of advice that you had gotten five years ago? Um, I think I have mentioned about this in our conversation earlier, letting people fail and letting them learn from their own mistakes is one piece of advice that I still remember. It really sticks with me because as designers, we always try to come up with the perfect solutions, right? With the best processes. And when it doesn't go according to our plan and how we imagine things, we can get easily frustrated. But sometimes we need to let people do the do stuff in their own way and learn from those mistakes if there are any mistakes. And it can also turn out in a different way, in an opposite way. Uh, it might be only us thinking that, oh, it's not going to work out. It might be totally different. Maybe it's going to work out. We need to be more willing and open to let things go. Mm, yeah and and not be not p 
pulling, not not trying to force things in a specific direction, uh, because that leads to frustration anyway. We can guide things, hopefully in a direction that we sort of envision. But if things go in a different direction, like that's we have to be open for that as well, because they do go like that's that's just nothing goes according to plan. <laughs> sure, that's life. Yeah, that's life. Um, at the start, you mentioned uh, somebody who listens to this and makes it all the way to the end might be more optimistic or pessimistic about service design. What are you? Are you more optimistic or pessimistic? In general? Yes. <laughs> um, I think I used to be more pessimistic in the past. Um, but even you can say that I'm getting wiser or I'm getting older. Maybe it's both. Um, I try to be a bit more optimistic or maybe more realistic uh, and realistic means that we also have to be honest to say when something is going well or if there's anything that's more on the optimistic side we choose to see that too and sometimes it's okay to admit that we have been a bit pessimistic i think being aware of who we are and how we see things um, is really important but i would still say that I'm more on the pessimistic side of the spectrum. Yeah, and I think I, I'm in peace with that because I really like my critical side. Sure, that's, that's awesome. Uh, and uh, that's the thing we sort of in, uh, implicitly, I think, talk about in this episode that being okay with who you are, uh, that's, that's maybe the secret to success, like accept the situation and uh, be at peace with it. Uh, and uh, that leads to less frustration and probably more enjoyment of life in general. Absolutely. On that note, Bridget, I really want to thank you for addressing this topic. Again, I hope that we'll be able to cover it more often uh, here on the show. Uh, we need more people helping us to design better services, uh, not less. So uh, again, thank you for sharing. Thank you, Mark. It was a pleasure. Awesome that you're one of those people who makes it all the way till the end of the episode. I really hope that you enjoyed it and got something useful out of it. If you did, make sure to leave a short comment down below. I'd really appreciate it. Thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you in the next video.